China launches a historic mission to explore the red planet. We will set our sights on the journey to Mars. Hello, I'm Arnold Nido and this is The Heat. The Chinese spacecraft is on its way to explore Mars. The goal is to observe the planet's atmosphere and surface, searching for signs of water and ice. China's largest rocket, the Long March 5, blasted off on Thursday from the southern island of Henan. According to the Aerospace Control Center, the Long March 5 rocket is in normal flight, and the probe to Mars has accurately entered the preset orbit. I now declare the launch of China's first Mars exploration mission a complete success. It's going to be a long journey, but not exactly a lonely one. Last Sunday, the United Arab Emirates launched a space probe, becoming the first Arab country to send a mission to Mars. And next week, the United States will launch its Perseverance rover. While all three spacecraft are expected to reach Mars next February, China's mission has a big distinction. It's the first time a country is sending an orbiter, a lander, and a rover in a single mission. And is there a chance that China and the US rovers will cross paths on the planet? The NASA rovers are within the vast area of our landing zone, but they will still be quite far away. From our point of view, Mars is large enough for multiple countries to explore and carry out missions. If they do meet, I'm sure that the scientists will dance with joy, because then there will be more scientific communication, which can create more achievements through cooperation. To talk about this historic mission, we welcome Dr. Michio Kaku. He is a theoretical physicist and professor of physics at the City College and City University of New York. Dr. Kaku, thanks for joining us. Glad to be on your show. We are seeing three missions to Mars in two weeks. Uh, why is there so much interest in the red planet right now? What are scientists hoping to learn? Well, first of all, we have a window of opportunity that opens up every 26 months. The planets are aligned. And that's why we're going to have a traffic jam. A traffic jam around Mars come February, when perhaps three space probes will begin to encounter the red planet. Now, this latest mission from the Chinese is historic. It's the first time in history that any nation has tried on the first try a three-in-one shot, an orbiter, a lander, and a rover, all in one shot. Usually, it takes years to decades to build up. First, you have an orbiter, then you land on the red planet, then you roam over the surface with the rover. No, the Chinese are ambitious, and they want to do it in one jump. That's historic. Now, these missions are, of course, unmanned. How far are we away from a manned mission to Mars? Well, you know, we can send humans to Mars. It's just a question of cost and, of course, the potential dangers. But most people think that sometime in the 2030s, Sometime, maybe 15, 20 years from now, humans will walk on the surface of the red planet. Realize that it's just an engineering problem. We've put landers on Mars. We have rovers on Mars. So we know we can do it. But it's an engineering problem to do it safely with life support. That's why it takes so long. Now, these uh, probes that are going to land on Mars, what kind of information will they send back to scientists here on Earth? Well, this uh, latest mission from the Chinese will have a spectrometer to measure the chemical composition of the environment, a magnetometer to measure the magnetic field of Mars, which is very important, and also ground-penetrating radar, that is, radar that can look underneath the surface of Mars. That's important because we know that, for the most part, the surface of Mars is barren of life. We see no evidence of life as we know it, on Mars. But perhaps under the surface, there could be lakes, underground deposits, perhaps liquid water. We don't know. And so ground-penetrating radar will give us the ability to look underneath the surface of Mars. Now, as scientists uh, develop plans to send uh, 
a human being to Mars, what are the risks that they would be looking for? What are the major challenges in sending a person to Mars? Well, to go to the moon is a hop, skip, and a jump. Three days, three days you're on the moon. Not much to worry about concerning radiation. However, a one-way trip to Mars takes nine months. And then you have to wait for the alignment of the planets to return, and another nine months with return. So basically, you're in a high radiation field for two years. And we don't know how the human body will respond to radiation on that level. That's why some scientists think that once we go to Mars, we should use lava tubes, caves, caves that were left over from ancient volcanic activity to shield us, shield us against micrometeorites, shield us against the intense radiation that we're going to find on Mars. And weightlessness. The world's record for being weightless in outer space is a little bit over one year. But now, think about two years under light, under weightless and near weightless conditions. So it's a challenge, a challenge to go to, moon, go to Mars and come back safely. Yeah, on the question of where people will live, you've written a book, actually, The Future of Humanity, in which you talk about terraforming Mars, making it livable for people on there. How would this be done? Well, you know, once upon a time, Mars was almost tropical compared to the Earth. That is, it had oceans, it had rivers, maybe even microbial life. We don't know. But it lost it. It lost its ancient water. So some people say, why not melt the polar ice caps? The polar ice caps have plenty of water, and this is called terraforming. Some people think that terraforming is impossible to change the planet's climate, but realize that we are terraforming the Earth right now. We are changing the Earth's weather. So we know that it's possible. We know that human activity can actually change the weather of an entire planet, and we see that on the planet Earth. So some people say, why not do that on Mars? You see, the dinosaurs did not have a space program. And that's why they're not here today. There are no dinosaurs running around today because they didn't have a space program, and they were helpless when an asteroid or a meteor hit Mexico 66 million years ago. Well, we do have a space program, and perhaps one day we'll be able to terraform Mars, heat up the polar ice caps, so that the ancient rivers and ancient oceans can once again support life, perhaps, on Mars. All right, Dr. Cabo, before that happens, uh, if people get onto the surface of Mars, would we have to recreate the Earth's atmosphere on Mars, uh, like living in a bubble of some kind? Well, not totally. You see, if you can raise the surface temperature of Mars by six degrees, that's all, just six degrees, then it takes off all by itself. Once you hit six degrees raising of the temperature on Mars, then ice begins to melt. That releases water vapor. Water vapor is a greenhouse gas, which makes more ice melt. And so you get this spiraling effect. So once we can raise the temperature of Mars by six degrees, then it takes off all by itself. Now, how do you do that? Perhaps solar satellites. Solar satellites can go around Mars and beam light energy down to the polar ice caps, melting the ice caps, so that we can start a greenhouse effect on Mars. Of course, that's way in the future, but that doesn't prevent humans from thinking and dreaming about one day creating a Garden of Eden on Mars. You know, there are 34 million miles that separate Earth from Mars, um, and that changes because these planets orbit. Do we have the kind of fuel that we needed uh, to send a, a spaceship on that kind of mission? Well, robotic missions, we do have enough fuel. However, some people have said that maybe we should try something more, plasma engines, nuclear engines. It turns out that a nuclear plasma engine would be able to go to Mars within a matter of weeks or perhaps a month or so, greatly shortening the amount of time. But there's a trade-off because, of course, we are talking nuclear. And if one of these rockets blows up, it could cause a tremendous amount of pollution here on the planet Earth. So for the time being, we're still stuck with conventional chemical rockets, but so far they have proven to be reliable, 
They can take us to the red planet. And as I said before, it's only an engineering problem to put humans on Mars. The basic physics is already known. So now you say it's only a hop, skip, and a jump to our moon. Uh, could our moon be used as um, a launch pad for a mission from there to Mars? Could, be, could it be used as a sort of stepping stone? Well, believe it or not, there's a debate going on among rocket scientists. Some people say, why, why bother to stop to the moon? We've been there. We've done that. Why not jump to Mars in one jump, bypassing the moon? Other people say, like, for example, uh, NASA says, perhaps we should have a lunar orbiter first that is a space station around the moon, and then build the rocket around the moon so that it can then go to Mars in a two-jump process. So there is a debate whether or not we should go to Mars in one jump or whether we should go to Mars in two jumps. You know, we've just seen this launch, which is a Chinese mission. The United States is also involved in sending uh, a probe to Mars. But there's no cooperation between the two countries. In fact, the United States bars any kind of cooperation uh, on missions of this type. Uh, could we see another space race? Well, let's hope that we have a peaceful exploration of outer space. There's something called the Outer Space Treaty of 1967. It's out of date. It has to be revised. But it was historic because it banned the use of nuclear weapons in outer space, one. And two, it said that nations cannot claim celestial bodies as their private territory. And so that was the foundation for the current exploration of outer space. But it has to be revised because, of course, it'd be very easy for a nation to put weapons in outer space, and it'd be very easy for nations to plant the flag, to plant the flag on the moon and Mars and create a whole new rivalry. So let's hope that we can have, at some point, a revised version Sorry. of the Outer Space Treaty of 1967. Dr. Michio Kaku, thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure. Let's continue our discussion right now. Let's bring in our panel. Joining us from Beijing, Yang Yuguang is a professor from China Aerospace Science and Industry Corporation. From Orlando, Florida, John Zarella is a journalist covering the United States space program. And Stephen Clark is a journalist for Space Flight Now. He joins us from Austin, Texas. Welcome to all of you. Professor Yang, let me start with you. If all goes according to plan, China will be the second country that will be putting a probe on Mars. Give us a sense of how significant that is for a country like China. Well, of course, Mars is a, a very hot point for the scientific research on planetary science. So China should do something about it. You see that China is already a very big country in space field. Our launch is uh, yes, uh, last year and the year before last uh, reaching the top one in the world. So in the future, we will also have our planetary uh, exploration programs. Tian one will be first. Uh, be, uh, after this, we will also have our Jupiter missions, asteroid missions, and even beyond. So this one is very important for us because we don't have this, uh, this kind of uh, attempt before. On the other hand, we should be aware that we are a developing country still, uh, so we need to uh, reduce the cost. And uh, combine the three missions together uh, with an orbiter, a uh, lander, and a rover will reduce much of the cost. So uh, it is very necessary for us to do to have this choice. But we should also be aware, but because you know that the especially the landing on the Martian surface will be very difficult. So it is very, still a very risky mission, and we will facing many challenges. John Zarella, next week the United States will launch its probe to Mars. What can you tell us about that mission and what it hopes to achieve? Well, the Perseverance uh, rover, when it lands, if it lands, uh, it, it is a very, it's very risky going to Mars. And even though NASA has successfully done it eight, nine times, soft landings on, on, uh, on, on Mars, this is really a pivotal mission. Not only is the rover going to land, but it will be collecting samples, soil samples, rock samples, burrowing down and putting them in canisters and then leaving them, dozens of these canisters, on the surface in piles. And then in 2026, what you have is perhaps the most ambitious of all missions where they are going to be sending, in conjunction with the European Space Agency, NASA, a fetch rover, which will go to Mars, it will collect the samples, bring them to a rocket on the surface, bring them to orbit, and then another orbiter will come, collect the samples, and bring them back to Earth 
around 2031. And the hope is that within these samples that they bring back, they will finally be able to answer the pivotal question that everybody wants to know. Did life once exist, microbial life, on the surface of Mars? So this is a huge first step, getting perseverance to the surface. But again, landing on Mars isn't easy. About 50% of all the spacecraft that have ever gone to Mars have failed at one point, one stage in their, their missions or another. So Mars is not easy, it's difficult. So John, I guess what we're seeing right now as far as the, uh, the US mission is concerned is we're seeing the first part of what will be a two-part mission that'll stretch out over, what, 11 years? Yeah, more than a decade, uh, and there's really not a lot, no way to really speed it up because of the fact that it's every two years you're flying, every two years you're coming back, so it, it you know, it does make it, uh, it does stretch it out. But, you know, you know, there's an old saying, as far as human exploration of Mars goes, that Mars has been 25 years away for 25 years, as far as sending humans. They were saying that 25 years ago, we're still saying that today. Uh, if it was easy to send humans to Mars, they would have been there already. All right, let me bring Stephen into the discussion. Stephen, this July is becoming a very exciting month for uh, Mars exploration. We've got uh, three missions going up, and it takes place in the space of two weeks. How will these missions increase our knowledge, not just of the Red Planet, but also of how we get there? Well, they're, they're all taking a, a, a little bit different approach of getting to Mars. Um, the Perseverance rover that NASA is sending uh, is, is based on the Curiosity rover that NASA launched back in 2011. And it's actually going to be taking a direct route to Mars. Uh, it won't be going into orbit. It's uh, just a lander and a rover, a very sophisticated rover. Whereas the Chinese mission, uh, Tianwen-1, uh, one is an orbiter, lander, and rover all in one. So we'll, we'll actually enter orbit around Mars in February 2021. And then a few months later, it will deploy uh, the lander to actually enter the Martian atmosphere, uh, go through what NASA likes to call the seven minutes of terror, the very risky part of entering the atmosphere that John was talking about, uh, where, where uh, many missions have failed. And the UAE Hope Orbiter is going to be entering orbit around Mars around the same time in February February of 2021. And they're, they're all kind of blazing their own path to Mars. And it'll, it'll be interesting to see in February 2021, it'll be a very busy time at Mars. Stephen, just one question. I mean, we're talking, as I uh, discussed with uh, Dr. Kaku, we're talking about 34 million miles between Earth and Mars. What actually powers these spacecraft through that distance in space to Mars? Well, if, if you're talking about the propulsion, uh, it's actually the rocket that launches them from Earth. Um, once these probes separate from the rocket uh, a few minutes to an hour after launch, they're kind of coasting the rest of the way to Mars and letting uh, physics take over, physics take the steering wheel, so to speak. And they're coasting until they get to Mars and then the Martian gravity actually pulls them in. And once they get to Mars, they fire their thrusters again to sort of steer into orbit. But uh, most of the time over the next seven months will be just a quiet, quiescent coast phase and uh, they'll be doing occasional course corrections along the way. But most of the work uh, is done during the launch and then the actual part of the arriving at Mars when they get into orbit. Professor Yang, uh, last year China was able to land a spacecraft on the far side of the moon, sometimes referred to as the dark side of the moon. Now it's conducting, uh, as we heard, a three-in-one mission. This will be a mission involving an orbiter, a lander, and a rover. Uh, what does that tell us about uh, Chinese space technology? Well, you see, uh, China is still a developing country, as I mentioned, and also uh, because we need to developing our uh, high technology field, this this kind of space uh, activities will be a very good promotion for our high technologies, and also will have returns directly or indirectly to China's uh, national economy and our daily life. So, in the future, we will not only have these this kind of deep space missions, such as the uh, um, uh, Mars mission, about robotic missions, and also, uh, as we have discussed, the sample return missions uh, proposed in the future, we will also have our own space station uh, within about two years. Uh, in the future, China's navigation system, the Beidou navigation system, uh, will provide comprehensive, comprehensive service 
uh, to the not only the Asia Pacific regions but also to the whole globe. In the future, it is possible that uh, China is now announced some uh, heat, heat technology uh, de development uh, for some kind of super heavy launch vehicles, which is potential for the use of the future manned mission to the moon. So in the future, China will also have many kinds of international corporations. For instance, this time, China has already uh, cooperated with Europe, uh, with France, with Argentina in this Tianwen-1 mission. And in the future missions, we can see more this kind of cooperation. China Space Station also will be act as a international plat uh, cooperation platform, not only as the national uh, space laboratory. So you see, uh, in the future, we will not have uh, competition because we know that we de develop the space te technology according to our own needs. It is meaningless for us to compete with other countries. So we will be, uh, it will be a winning game for us to cooperate with other countries. John Zarella, very early in his term, President Trump uh, authorized NASA to lead what well, was a pretty innovative program to go back to Mars and the, uh, to go back to the moon rather and then on to Mars. Uh, what do you make of these plans? I and mean, how much of a priority is it now for um, the United States? Well, it's still a major priority and NASA is still saying, you know, we're going to put uh, a man and a woman on the surface of the moon in 2024. Quite frankly, in my opinion, I don't know, know how Stephen feels, but I think it's that's kind of a long shot at best simply because the, uh, the, the, the big, huge uh, rocket that they need to get there, the SLS, uh, and the framework to put people on, on the moon just isn't, isn't ready yet. It's not matured yet. Uh, they talked about building a gateway around the moon, maybe using that as a station, and then dropping down to the surface from there. Uh, but 2024, you know, as some former astronauts said to me, was, well, it's nice to have, you, uh, a, you know, a goalpost set, uh, but... This one is awfully, awfully ambitious. When you haven't even flown your big, massive rocket, which is the size of a Saturn V rocket, the old NASA moon rockets, if you haven't even flown it yet and probably won't fly it for another year and a half or so, maybe two years, it's going to be awfully difficult to meet that kind of a time frame. 2028 was an original time frame. Then all of a sudden they decided they could do this by 2024, 2025. Um, and then at some point from there on, build a moon base, build an infrastructure on the moon, use that as a test bed for going to Mars. Uh, so if that's the time frame you're looking at, Mars still remains certainly probably the mid-2030s at the earliest before you would see boots on the ground in Ma on Mars, um, unless Elon Musk does something remarkable, and he's apt to do things like that. But I think the timetable for getting U.S. astronauts uh, on the surface of the moon is, is a little bit ambitious, to say the least. Stephen, what are your thoughts on those missions? I have to, I have to agree with what John just said. Uh, uh, returning a crew to the moon, landing a man and a woman on the moon in 2024 is a, a, a tall challenge for NASA. And I, I, for one, will be surprised if they do achieve it. And there, John mentioned the, the massive new rocket that NASA is developing, the space launch system, still a year or two away from launching. It's been in, in development now for uh, the better part of a decade, uh, but still hasn't uh, uh, turned the final corner to go to the launch pad. And also NASA is just starting the process of developing and building and designing uh, landers to actually carry astronauts to the moon surface. That is still in the very early phase. And given how long it's taken NASA to build uh, the, the rocket part, the, the new moon rocket, uh, building a moon lander in four years is uh, going to be a very challenging uh, notion for NASA. Professor Yang, uh, the United States bars cooperation with China on these uh, space missions. Uh, so we've got China sending a mission up. Well, that mission has just started, and the United States will send its rockets up uh, next week. Uh, does that mean that whatever data these two countries gather, what kind of uh, information, scientific details they gather, will not be shared between them? Uh, I think uh, we did.
uh, with uh, space field has formed this kind of tradition that the uh, scientific research data will be open to the whole world. You see that uh, for the, as you mentioned, the uh, the Chang'e 4 mission uh, is the first one of the human being uh, landing a robotic uh, probe to the far side of the moon, and we've already opened that data to, to the whole world. And you see, although the United States, the Congress, banned the uh, cooperation with China, but the, the NASA has also required the, uh, that uh, to consider to use the uh, data really satellite, the Magpie Bridge, uh, or Chie Chiao, uh, from China to uh, for future mission uh, to the far side of the moon. So you see, it is possible for this kind of cooperation, although we already have cooperation with Europe uh, with uh, and also other countries. But still, I hope that in the future, we can have cooperation with the United States. And also, uh, the, uh, the data I get from the Perseverance and Curiosity rover, uh, I think it will be uh, very useful for Chinese scientists to understand, uh, to have a better and a comprehensive understanding of the Mars and the, of the future destination of Mars. You see that uh, our, our landers and our rovers uh, usually choose different landing set, sites. So even if they have the same kind of uh, the same type of payload, they can get different information from the Mars. The, this is very important for us. Uh, you see that although we already have more than 50 missions to Mars, but still we have little knowledge about this planet. It is so huge. So we need the scientists to work together to get a better understanding of this. John, uh, what are the risks of this kind of space exploration leading to the militarization of space and just pushing this frontier out uh, in a great power rivalry? I, you know, I, at this point in time, and, and who knows where it, where it will happen in the future, it's it's still so rudimentary to think that other than in low Earth orbit, where you could certainly see militarization of space, um, but when you're talking about interplanetary, when you're talking about the moon or Mars, um, we're talking so far off in the distance. The world is going to be a much different place by the time we would get to the point where militarization of, of outer space uh, was a reality. Star Trek is not, you know, not around the corner. Um, because again, if you go back to what it's going to take to get humans to Mars, think of it this way, the infrastructure that you would have to build to get people there. And then you have to be able to manufacture rocket fuel on the surface so you can fuel your rockets to get them back home again. I'm, I'm, the things that you would have to do uh, that we still have to learn, the ability to the psychological uh, implications of humans going to uh, outer planets. But now if you're talking about militarization of space yeah. from the standpoint of remote vehicles right. that humans are not a part of, that's a different story and that's more low Earth orbit. But I just don't, I don't see it. I don't see it happening anytime, certainly not in our lifetimes. Okay, and that's where we have to leave it. Thanks to all of you for being with us. That's it for this edition of The Heat, but the conversation continues online. Join us on CGTN America's Facebook page to comment on this or any other show or chat with us on Twitter at CGTN America. I'm Arnand Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for being with us. <laughs>